Good afternoon, Messiah Kids. Um, today, I have a book. I know we did Pete the Cat last week. However, I have a book called Moses the Kitten. And it's a really lovely story that I wanted to share with you. And I am, I will read and then I will show you pictures because there is so much writing in this book. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't make copies of it. Um, anyhow, the author is James Harriet, and he was a veterinarian in real life in England um, about a hundred years ago. And the stories he writes are really wonderful. And this one um, is about a kitten named Moses. Moses is a black cat. And um, it is a true story, so it's pretty cool. There have been times in the winter when I have regretted being a vet and this looked like one of them. Um, also, James Harriet was a veterinarian in England, so a little bit different than here in the US. I had driven about 10 miles from home thinking all the time that the Dales always look their coldest, not when they were covered with snow, but as now, when the first sprinkling streak the bare flanks of the fells in bars of black and white, like the ribs of a crouching beast. And now in front of me was a farm gate rattling on its hinges as the wind shook it. So you can see it's a little more barren. They have, um, rock walls instead of fences like we would have and that was to keep the sheep where they belonged or the cows i suppose the car heaterless and drafty as it was seemed like a haven in an uncharitable world and i gripped the wheel tightly with my woolen gloved hands for a few minutes before opening the door. The wind almost tore the handle from my fingers as I got out, but I managed to crash the door shut before stumbling over the frozen mud to the gate. Muffled as I was in a heavy coat and scarf pulled up to my ears, I could feel the icy gusts biting at my face whipping up my nose and hammering painfully into the air spaces in my head. I had driven through and streaming eyed was about to get back into the car when I noticed something unusual. There was a frozen pond just off the path and among the rind covered rushes which fringed the pond an object stood out, shiny black. So his car is really old compared to ours, and he had to get out, open the gate, drive through, get back out, and close the gate. But this is what he spotted. And you probably guessed that's going to be Moses the cat. Now remember, he was found in rushes, which are um, like weeds at the edge of a marsh. I went over and looked closer. It was a tiny kitten, probably about six weeks old, huddled and immobile, eyes tightly closed. Bending down, I picked and poked gently at the furry body. It must be dead. A morsel like this couldn't possibly survive in such cold, but no. There was a spark of life because the mouth opened soundlessly for a second, then closed. Quickly, I lifted the little creature and tucked it inside my coat. As I drove into the farmyard, I called to the farmer who was carrying two buckets out of the calf house. 
I've got one of your kittens here, Mr. Butler. It must have strayed outside. Mr. Butler put down his buckets and looked blank. Kitten? We haven't got no kittens at present. I showed him my find and he looked more puzzled. Well, that's a rummin. There's no black cats on this spot. We've all sorts of colors, but no black ones. Well, he must have come from somewhere else, I said, though I can't imagine anything so small traveling very far. It's rather mysterious. So you see the building, the barn is made out of stone. So you can tell this is a long time ago. I held the kitten out and he engulfed it with his big work roughened hands. Poor little beggar, he's only just alive. I'll take him into the house and see if the missus can do out for him. And there's rest of the farmyard. And you'll notice some of the words are kind of funny because of how the people in the country talked. In the farm kitchen, Mrs. Butler was all concerned. Oh, what a shame. She smoothed back the beraggled hair with one finger, and it's got such a pretty face. She looked up at me. What is it anyway, a him or a her? Took a quick look behind the hind legs. It's a Tom. Right, she said, I'll get some warm milk into him, but first of all, we'll give him the old cure. Hmm. The old cure. She went over to the fireside oven on the big black kitchen range, opened the door, and popped him inside. I smiled. It was the classical procedure when newborn lambs were found suffering from cold and exposure. Into the oven they went, and the results were often dramatic. Mrs. Butler left the door partly open, and I could just see the little black figure inside. He didn't seem to care much what was happening to him. So there he is inside the big oven. But that was something they did back then. Okay, now, the veterinarian, Dr. Harriet, he goes out into the barn because this cow has an issue with its feet. So let's find out what he does. The next hour I spent, I spent in the buyer or the, or the barn, wrestling with the hind feet of a cow. The cleats were overgrown and grossly misshapen and upturned, causing the animal to hobble along on her heels. My job was to pair and hack away the excess horn and my long-held opinion that the hind feet of a cow were never meant to be handled by man was thoroughly confirmed. We had a rope around the hawk and the leg pulled up over a beam in the roof, but the leg still pistoned out, back and forth, back and forth, while I hung on till my teeth rattled. By the time I had finished, the sweat was running into my eyes, and I had quite forgotten the cold day outside. Still, I thought as I eased the kinks from my spine when I had finished, there were compensations. There was satisfaction in the sight of the cow standing comfortably on two almost normal looking feet. Well, that's something, Mr. Butler grunted. Come in the house and wash your hands. So see the cow, her feet are all better now. But they had to put a rope around them, but it, the cow still would kick Dr. Harriet. In the kitchen, as I bent over the brown earthenware sink, I kept glancing across at the oven. Uh, 
Mrs. Butler laughed. Oh, he's still with us. Come and have a look. It was difficult to see the kitten in the dark interior, but when I spotted him, I put out my hand and touched him and he turned his head towards me. He's coming round, I said. That hour in there has worked wonders. Doesn't often fail, the farmer's wife lifted him out. I think he's a little tough one. She began to spoon warm milk into the tiny mouth. I reckon we'll have him, him lapping in a day or two. You're going to keep him then? Too true we are. I'm going to call him Moses. Moses? I, you found him among the rushes, didn't you? I laughed. That's a good name. So there the farmer's wife is with Moses. And if you remember in the Bible, when Moses was a baby, he was put in a basket and put in the rushes, which were the long weeds, so that he could be saved. And so that's why this kitty's named Moses. I was on the Butler farm about a fortnight later. I think that's around two weeks, I'm not sure. And I kept looking around for Moses. Farmers rarely have their cats indoors and I thought that if the black kitten had survived, he would have joined the feline colony around the buildings. Farm cats have a pretty good time. They may not be petted or cosseted, but it was it has always seemed to me that they lead a free natural life. They are expected to catch mice, but if they are not so inclined, there is abundant food at hand. Bowls of milk here and there and the dog's dishes to be raided if anything interesting is left over. So there he is with Farmer Butler. Let's see if we can find out where Moses is. I had seen plenty of cats around today, some flitting nervously away, others friendly and purring. There was a tabby loping gracefully across the cobbles and a big tortoise shell was curled on a bed of straw at the warm end of the barn. Cats are connoisseurs of comfort. When Mr. Butler went to fetch some hot water, I had a quick look in the bullock house and a white tom regarded me placidly from between the bars of a hay rack where he had been taking a siesta. But there was no sign of Moses. So there's all those other cats that Dr. Harriet encountered, but no Moses. Hmm. I finished drying my arms and was about to make a casual reference to the kitten when Mr. Butler handed me my jacket. Come round here with me if you've got a minute, he said. I've got something to show you. I followed him through the door at the end and across a passage into the long, low-roofed piggery. He stopped at a pen about halfway down and pointed inside. Look there, he said. I leaned over the wall and my face must have shown my astonishment because the farmer burst into a shout of laughter. That's somewhat new for you, isn't it? So there he is. He's heading into the piggery, which, as you might guess, is where the pigs live. And look at that. There's a mama pig or a sow. And she's got all of her babies. But look who is nursing with Mama Pig. It's baby Moses, our kitten Moses. I stared unbelievingly down at a large sow stretched comfortably on her side, suckling a litter of about 12 piglets and right in the middle of the long pink row 
furry, black, and incongruous was Moses. He had a teat in his mouth and was absorbing his nourishment with the same rapt enjoyment as his fellow piglet, as the piglets. What the heck, I gasped. Mr. Butler was still laughing. I thought you'd never have seen anything like that before. I never have anyhow. But how did it happen? I still couldn't drag my eyes away. It was the missus' idea, he replied. When she got the little youth lap and milk, she took him out to find a right warm spot for him in the buildings. She settled on this pen because the sow, Bertha, had just had a litter and I had a heater and it was grand and cozy. I nodded. Sounds just right. And there's another picture of Moses with the piglets. How fun is that? Well, she put Moses in a bowl of milk in here, the farmer went on, but the little feller didn't stay by the heater very long. Next time I looked in, he was round at the milk bar. So that's another word for the mama pig. I shrugged my shoulders. They say you see something new every day at this game, but this is something I've never even heard of. Anyway, he looks well on. Does he actually live on the sow's milk, or does he still drink from his bowl? A bit of both, I reckon. It's hard to say. Anyway, whatever mixture Moses was getting, he grew rapidly into a sleek, handsome animal with an unusually high gloss to his coat, which may or may not have been due to the pig element of his diet. So there is Moses as a grown-up cat. I never went to the butler's without having a look in the pig pen. Bertha, his foster mother, seemed to find nothing unusual in this hairy intruder and pushed him around casually with pleased grunts just as she did the rest of her brood. Moses, for his part, his part, appeared to find the society of the pigs very happy. When the piglets curled up together and settled down for a sleep, Moses would be somewhere in the heap. When his young colleagues were weaned at eight weeks, he showed his attachment to Bertha by spending most of his time with her. So there they all are. I think Moses had a good life. And it stayed that way over the years. Often he would be right inside the pen, rubbing himself happily along the comforting bulk of the pig. But I remember him best in his favorite place, crouching on the wall, looking down perhaps meditatively on what had been his first warm home. I hope you enjoyed that book. Now Moses, he adapted. That means he was able to live in the situation that he was given. And sometimes things don't always go right or we find ourselves someplace we didn't plan on. So we have to be flexible and we have to adapt. And so I was looking for Bible verses about being able to adapt. So the first one is from Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So you don't have to be what the world tells you you have to be. You need to figure out what you need to be and to adapt to what you need to be and what you think God would be pleased with. 
So that was in Romans, which is in the New Testament. And then we're going to go to Philippians, which again is in the New Testament. And we are looking at Philippians 1, verse 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. So no matter how you adapt or um, what you decide to do, God created you. He began the good work in you. And he will be there always to see it through. And then the last Bible verse is from Jeremiah, chapter 15, verse 16, and that's in the Old Testament. Your words are what sustain me. They bring me great joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. So just knowing what God wants for you and following where he's calling is what helps you be adaptable. Now I know we've made a lot of cats, but Moses the cat, he's quite different looking from Pete the cat. So I thought we needed to make a black cat. So what I did is I just took a piece of black construction paper and um, as you can see, it's the letter C. Now it's backwards. So the letter C, so I just cut that out. So it's kind of like the letter C for cat. Isn't that clever? And then I made a fun tail and um, then his head again is just folded over. So it's kind of an oval circle, not quite a circle. And then like we did with Pete the cat, we have triangles for his ears and his nose. And then I just made yellow ovals with um, black marker for his eyes. So I thought he was a very handsome Moses the cat. And he, he stands up. You guys can't see him. But he stands up because if you fold his feet, see how I have his feet folded? There we go. There, that's a good angle. Then he'll stand up. All right, that was a longer book today. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful summer day. Thank you for old stories about places and a time where we have never been. And um, I pray that all of us can learn to be adaptable because our world is changing right now and we need to be adaptable. Listen for you to guide us and lead us in the way that we should go. I ask your blessing on my Messiah kids and their friends and family and be with us until the next time. Amen. All right, Messiah kids, I will see you on Friday. And I have another good book about something that's very Minnesotan. See ya.